Hi there, everybody. I'm Lauren Burchard, Director of Historical Programs at the U.S. Capitol Historical Society. We're so pleased to have you with us today for another edition of Lunch Bites with Steve and Jane. We're on part five of History All Around Us, and today Steve will be discussing a portion of First Street Northeast. So now I will turn it over to Sam Holliday from the U.S. Capitol Historical Society. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be with you. I'm substituting in for Jane today. She had uh, some important Board of Trustees business to attend to, so you'll be stuck with my mug uh, for different parts of today's lecture. Uh, once again, we're so grateful that you're able to join us uh, for this wonderful program, and thank you to Lauren uh, and Charlotte and everyone else who's done such incredible work putting on these great uh, virtual public history programs. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Steve Livengood to discuss uh, First Street Between A and East Capitol as featured in Creating Capitol Hill, our wonderful book that we'll talk more about later. Steve? Okay, we're gonna be talking about the intersections of First Street Northeast at A Street and East Capitol Street. Uh, a lot of things happen on this location as is true of most places on Capitol Hill. Uh, but uh, we're gonna spend a little time. Uh, one of the previous participants has asked to have more maps up. Uh, she particularly likes them and to spend more time with them. So uh, I'm gonna go quickly through maps, uh, some extra ones uh, today, and then come back to them and, uh, and work for them from them uh, some more. This is the first one. This is LaFont's uh, drawing of what, this, what uh, he proposed the city should look like. And uh, you can see the two arrows there pointing to uh, this particular square, and that's what we're gonna talk about. Um, this is Don Hawkins' map from the book uh, in which uh, he shows wh what we can figure out about what was going on in 1801 when the Congress got here. And you can see the arrows are again pointing to the same block, but the streets are not there. And uh, uh, that's because they, cut them little by little, and uh, uh, we're spending a lot of time doing surveying and so forth, which hadn't been done. And so uh, the uh, area is not really uh, ready yet, but it's interesting to see the way that it developed, and that's what we're gonna talk about. This is the, the uh, 1815 map, and uh, uh, this is what was the situation was after the fire. And again, the, um, uh, the block is marked there. Uh, so that you can see what we're talking about. And then this is the map today. Uh, you can see the Capitol grounds are a block wider. Uh, those arrows are in the same position, but the blocks between there and the Capitol have been wiped out and made just a general part of the, of the grounds. And what sits on that uh, block there between those two blue arrows is this. This is the Supreme Court, it's right across the street from the Capitol. Uh, and uh, what we're going to be talking about is what, what was there before the court got there, because it's an interesting story, as always. Now, I was looking, uh, and this is East Capitol Street uh, as it exists today. We're going to talk about that uh, a little bit as well. So I, I went to the, to the Don Hawkins map here, of what was going on in 1801. And uh, you can see the yellow arrow is up there where uh, A Street used to be and where uh, Delaware Avenue was sort of extended, and we talked about that block uh, a few weeks ago. But on the other side, you can see the green arrow, which is showing you where, the, um, where A Street was to be, and those, those little black Xs are the, the uh, stone markers that were used to, to mark where the streets were gonna be, uh, but the streets obviously hadn't been cut yet. Uh, uh, there's no indication that there are trees there, but that the land was not evened out or anything. The, the street was just not established yet. Um, but the interesting thing to me was that the streets, at East Capitol and um, uh, B Street or A Street uh, on the south, uh, both ended uh, there at uh, at Third Street. And that is an intriguing story. Um, what that does is to mark the land that belonged to Daniel Carroll. Uh, the, his, uh, his property stopped before Third Street. And so this shows that he's the one that's developing around here. And the people that owned the property past that were not. 
And this is an, this is an unusual map. I used this a couple of weeks ago, and it was pointed out to me by one listener that uh, I misstated its source. So I, I want to explain that this, this map, which is in the section of the book that uh, uh, Don Hawkins did, is not done by Don Hawkins. It is done by Priscilla McNeil, who did the research on it, and by Cynthia Elliott, who actually drew it. So um, uh, in honor of um, women in history, we want to honor those two uh, women today. Uh, for having laid out this very interesting map of as much as we can tell about who owned what uh, in the original city of Washington. The uh, two yellow arrows refer to the, the uh, property that belonged to Daniel Carroll of Duddington, and the, the one at the top left is the, uh, locates where the capital itself is. Uh, the other one shows the boundary between Daniel Carroll and the next uh, owner, and you can see that there in front of the Capitol, um, it stops. And those are where the, that's where the street stops because Daniel Carroll had, had uh, uh, paid for getting the streets uh, done in his area where he wanted to develop and the next uh, owner had not. The next owner was um, Jonathan Slater. He had purchased this property in 1764. So he's had it for, for uh, 30 years at this point. And in fact, he had already sold it to his son-in-law uh, William Prout. Uh, he sold it in March uh, 1791, but the sale was not completed yet, and so it is still attributed to Slater at this point. Uh, Slater died by 1799, and the sale of his lots, his uh, uh, property was not completed until 1799 um, uh, by his heirs, his sons, uh, who, who um, signed over their interest in the property to Prout. Prout was a, a shipmaster, and uh, in 1792, he was engaged in, in uh, bringing Irish immigrants to America. And uh, we think he probably had something to do with recruiting the Irish workers that came to Washington to work on the capital and the construction of the city. Uh, Prout's land went south all the way down toward the Navy Yard. You can see the bottom of it. Uh, at where it ends at the bottom of the screen here. And that is where he concentrated his development, uh, probably servicing or providing the, the infrastructure that was needed for those uh, Irish immigrants. And that's where the population uh, got built up uh, er earliest um, center of population in the city of Washington was down there. Um, that's where the port and the industrial workers were. Uh, he, he opened a tavern, he opened the first hotel on Capitol Hill, he opened a market, a fishery, a dry goods store, a brick uh, dealer, and a hay dealer. Uh, he is the one who de donated the land for Christ Church, which was the Episcopal, the Episcopal um, Church in, uh, in the Capitol Hill area, the, the oldest one, it's at 6th, Street between, uh, I'm sorry, it's on G Street between 6th and 7th and still exists today. He may have even uh, contributed the land for another church that's on the hill. But he did not develop his land on Capitol Hill, only the part down by the Navy Yard. Uh, the, um, the book says that Prout is one of the few proprietors to remain solvent throughout the whole period. The third owner is Overton Carr, and in this case, the, the um, uh, map is marked Walker. Overton Carr had, uh, had owned the property before. You can see it's called the Hop Yard here, and he actually lived there. Uh, and he, he was one of the, of the proprietors that George Washington had asked to buy out the small landowners around. And he had done so, but then he immediately sold his land to George Walker. Um, the land was purchased by Walker, and, and Walker is the one that donated the land to uh, the city of Washington. Walker was a very enthusiastic promoter. He had come to, to Georgetown uh, in the 1780s from Scotland. And um, uh, he was a tobacco merchant but obviously interested in a lot of things because he's the one apparently who commissioned the first map uh, to be given to George Washington showing uh, what was possible between Georgetown and 
uh, Carrollsburg, that is the Anacostia River, uh, and show that a, that a large city was possible here. So he may be the one that introduced the idea to George Washington of having a larger city. He, uh, he was friends with Prout, and there's some suggestion he may have, have recruited Prout to come uh, and, uh, and invest here. He bought Carr's plantation and lived there, he bought, but he bought three lots at public sale uh, in Square 728, which is the one that we're talking about. He did not buy them from Duddington directly. He bought them in the public sale. He all, later was also an original best investor in the first Eastern Branch Bridge, the one that was done at Kentucky Avenue uh, early on. Now we go back to this uh, 1801 map and I have marked uh, this particular location and that's where the lots are that George Walker bought. Uh, he, uh, he wanted to build a, a hotel near the Capitol. So he bought uh, three lots there. You can see by, he, uh, by 1801, the street still wasn't in front of his lots, but he has built his building and it was known originally as a Walker's Hotel. Uh, he opened in 1796. This is much earlier than, than uh, the other things that we've talked about uh, generally. Uh, and the comment was made uh, when it opened in the newspaper uh, that uh, at least the uh, uh, Walker's Hotel had a roof on it, which the Capitol didn't, and many of the other buildings didn't either, as I mentioned uh, in the past. Uh, the Capitol Hill Tavern was, uh, was particularly noted for the Aquia Creek sandstone decoration on the front of it. Uh, that was a little more decoration than a lot of buildings uh, that were being put up at the time. And it's the same sandstone that, that is being used to construct the Capitol and the White House. Uh, later on, this location was ad, uh, advertised as the Capitol Hill Tavern, uh, but it had, at first at least, it had uh, dining and meeting rooms, it had stables, so it was for travelers and unlike a boarding house. Uh, and it even had recreation, it advertised shuffleboard and a nine pin alley uh, for bowling. The hotel was run at first by a woman named Elizabeth Leslie, but, but um, uh, George Walker had sold the building to Winnie, William Tunnicliffe uh, in October of 1800, uh, probably by the time this map was done. Uh, apparently, he had trouble keeping people to, uh, to keep the hotel there. Uh, there wasn't a lot of, of, of business, and uh, he'd had to get a new hotel keeper just about every year. So he, find, he sells the hotel to, uh, to William Tunnicliffe, who already had a hotel uh, down by the Navy Yard. Uh, and Tunnicliffe runs it as the Washington City Hotel, so it has several names. Um, uh, Walker himself went to London to try to sell lots and shares in Washington, uh, but he was unsuccessful in that, and he moved back to Scotland in 1800 and never returned to Washington. So there, there are three illustrative stories here of Capitol Hill development. The first one is Daniel Carroll of Duddington, who wants to attract cabinet officers and members of Congress, rich people and his own relatives, uh, to this place. And but they, these people stayed only a few months out of the year and never supported the neighborhood much. So there was, uh, Daniel Carroll was in constant financial trouble the whole time through this period and finally gave up after the panic of 1819 and didn't try to develop much more. Uh, Thomas Law that we've talked about uh, also uh, uh, had uh, financial trouble through this period, but he, decided to lower the prices of his land and, and his buildings to try to get people attracted to actually buy them. And uh, there are some letters where, where uh, Thomas Law is suggesting that Daniel Carroll wouldn't have so much trouble if he'd lower the price. Uh, but Daniel Carroll refused to do that. Now, one, mo one um, uh, note that just occurs to me at this moment is that Thomas, uh, uh, Thomas Law, if you remember, got rich by getting the Maharaja in India to lower the price of, the, of admission to this holy sites and made himself and the Maharaja rich by lowering the prices. And so he's got some experience with this. And Daniel Carroll doesn't, and Daniel Carroll won't lower the prices to it because he might attract lower class people. Uh, 
So he struggles. Um, George Walker, the second one, uh, had lots of energy and did lots of promoting. He recruited other business people uh, and, uh, and even bought out a proprietor. Daniel Carroll at least inherited the land. Uh, but uh, George Walker buys out another proprietor, but he's unable to attract investors. Uh, he has to find new hotel keepers every year, and he gives up by 1800. In between the two is William Prout, uh, who may even have been recruited by Walker, but he has brought in these Irish laborers and he uh, orients his investment to them. He built ordinary businesses, a tavern, a market, fishery, brick, selling bricks and hay down by the Navy Yard where the people actually were. Uh, and they had year-round uh, year employment. Uh, he didn't build up by the capital. He, he didn't build to try to uh, attract fancy people who did not stay, and he's the one that was successful. Now, this is the square itself. Uh, the blue arrow marks uh, Walker's Tavern. It's, uh, it's numbered uh, 728. This is from uh, the Latrobe map. And um, uh, this is the hotel building, but you can see it is now attached to something else, uh, which is the old brick capital. But in the meanwhile, before it gets attached, uh, it was uh, 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 Walker sold out his interest completely, the land and everything in 1801 to Pontius Stella, who also is a, a uh, character uh, keeping hotels and so forth uh, on Capitol Hill. It was uh, sold uh, by Stella by 1810 to somebody else. It sold again in 1811, in 1812, in 1813, and finally bought by Daniel Carroll of Duddington in 1815. Now that's the year that the, that, uh, the British had burned uh, Duddington's uh, tavern and hotel uh, over on what's now the Capitol grounds. And so just within months of in, in um, May, in May he sold the ruins of his other tavern and bought this one in July. Um, but now it's talk, time to talk about the the old brick capital. Uh, this is a picture of it later, uh, and uh, you may be able to notice at the bottom, this is right across the street from the Capitol. It's on the corner where the Supreme Court is now, uh, and it had, uh, by the time of this picture, 1865, uh, it had been there for uh, 50 years, and yet the streets are still not paved. This shows that even, even with the Civil War, they have not paved the streets in Washington, right in front of the Capitol. Um, but you see the orange arrow, and that is the building that we think was uh, Walker's Tavern. You can see the windows have a little bit of decoration above them uh, and, and nice sills, which the, uh, the newer part of the building, which is the part closest to us, uh, doesn't have. Uh, and so that may be the Aquia Sandstone that we're talking about it may be that that's not the building that was being described. We don't know for sure. But uh, it, it uh, became the uh, part of the old brick capital, which is where the, where the Congress met. And I'm going to talk about that. But I do want to note that, this, that eventually that became part of the headquarters of the, of the women's suffrage campaign. And the bricks for, from that building were, were uh, preserved and are now make up the patio at the uh, Sewell Belmont House, which is the Suffrage National Historic Site, uh, just a block away from there. Now, Congress appropriated, after the British burned uh, the Capitol building, the Congress appropriated funds to rebuild the burned Capitol uh, and then uh, went home. But they did not designate any funds for an interim meeting place. And uh, Duddington and Thomas Law were concerned that the Congress would never return if they went off to Annapolis or Baltimore or someplace where there was appropriate meeting space and that all of the money that they had invested here in Washington uh, would, be, would be gone. And so uh, they went to the, the uh, commissioners uh, who, were, who had responsibility for the money and the commissioner said, no, we cannot use this money for anything except rebuilding the Capitol. They even appealed to President Madison, and he agreed with the commissioners. 
And so, uh, as is the continuing story on Capitol Hill, Thomas Law says, we've got to do it ourselves. And so he gets together, uh, Daniel Carroll was one of the investors and probably provided uh, much of the land for it. But they get a group of people together and they are gonna put up a building for the Congress so that the Congress doesn't go somewhere else. Now the Congress was meeting at that point at Blodgett's Hotel over on 7th Street, but it was, that was the biggest building in town besides the Capitol itself, but it was just not adequate for the Congress and, and uh, uh, the law and the others knew that the Congress wasn't gonna like that. And so um, uh, they said, we'll, we'll put up this building as an investment. And uh, even, if the, even if the Congress decides not to use it, it'll make a good hotel site uh, with big meeting rooms that the city didn't have and, uh, and uh, so forth. But they, they thought, uh, uh, they knew that they had to get it done in a hurry. So here's the quotation from the, from the period about the construction of this building. It says, quote, the spot on which this spacious building stands was a cabbage garden on the morning of the 4th of July. That afternoon, the digging was commenced. Congress convened there on December the 5th. So it is four months that it took them to put up uh, the building, the big building that you can see right in the front and center here. So that's what sat on the corner uh, where the Supreme Court is now. Uh, but it's the corner of A Street and not um, Maryland Avenue, uh, which I will show you in a moment on the map. Uh, because uh, A Street existed at that point, it does not now. Congress reconvened um, on December 5th and, uh, and first looked over the building and decided, yes, that is what they needed. And so they uh, leased it right away. And so Thomas Law and Daniel uh, Carroll are, are triumphant again. They have moved in and done the civic thing that was needed uh, that the Congress wouldn't do. And they're the ones that we credit with creating Capitol Hill because they made decisions like that, did what was needed and carried them out. Uh, if you look at the building, the, the House of Representatives was upstairs, the Senate was downstairs. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the wing that was Walker's Hotel that has the orange arrow there is where there were, were offices and committee rooms. The Congress met there from 1815 uh, to 1816 and then after the election, they came back 1817 and 18, but they were back in the Capitol by 1819. President James Monroe was inaugurated outside this building. Uh, the legend is, and I haven't seen it actually documented, but it, uh, because the congressional record doesn't exist word for word in that period, but uh, supposedly there was a, a um, controversy between the House and the Senate as to whose chamber they were going to use. Uh, for the inauguration, and finally Monroe said, oh, let's just do it outside, and that, uh, and that is why we had an out, outdoor inauguration. Uh, you may remember that George Washington was, was, um, took the oath of office outside on the balcony at Federal Hall in New York uh, for his first inauguration, uh, but then he went inside to give his speech. So the first time that both the speech and the oath were done outside was when James Monroe did it at this building. Uh, Andrew Jackson in uh, 1829 is the one who finally establishes the tradition of doing them outside all the time. Uh, so the Congress met in there. The, uh, uh, the Supreme Court did not meet here. They had their own building over on New Jersey Avenue in Southwest, as I, or in Southeast, I mean, as I pointed out a few weeks ago, but the Treaty of Ghent that ended the War of 1812 established a, a commission process by which uh, the, the U.S. and Britain would, would establish the, uh, negotiate over the, over the details of the program uh, and, and reparations for uh, destroyed property, and though the meetings took place in the old Brit capital here after the Congress had vacated it. Um, then it, would, then it was uh, uh, taken over and made into a, a boarding house. Uh, but other things were done here when Thomas Jefferson uh, sold his library to the Congress. Uh, 
the library was housed here until the, the uh, center part of the Capitol could be built where they provided for all these books, 6,000 books. Uh, John Trumbull's sketches for the paintings in the rotunda were first exhibited in this building. Uh, and uh, uh, some uh, rooms were, were used for sculpture studios. In, per in particular, we know that Luigi Persico uh, worked on the genius of the Constitution, the, the front center pediment of the, uh, of the Capitol building uh, in, the, in the basement of this uh, building and that pieces of the Statue of Freedom were stored there before they were installed in the Capitol. I think it was a, a year and a half between the time they arrived in Washington and when the dome was ready for the statue to be put up there. And, uh, and also in the boarding house, Senator and former Vice President John C. Calhoun died in that boarding house. So a lot went on over the years. Then in 1861, it became the Capitol Prison. Uh, right after the, the um, uh, first battle of Manassas, uh, the troops came streaming back into Washington. There was no place to put them. And so the, the, uh, uh, every building in town was requisitioned, even the churches, uh, to be used as hospitals and as barracks and, as, and, uh, and in this case, as a prison. Uh, in fact, right after the battle, they used the rotunda of the Capitol for the hospital and the troops slept on the marble floors. But then they, they immediately built a temporary barracks for them and, and every vacant lot in the city, particular ones that, that were, in, uh, were close in, were used as, uh, for this purpose, hospitals, barracks, and prisons all over the city. This was the most elite prison. The spies, Rose Greenhow and Bell Boyd, were were uh, uh, incarcerated here, uh, the Lincoln conspirators and John Mosby were, were uh, confined here. And uh, then Henry Wirtz, the commander of the Andersonville prison, uh, where the prisoners were allowed to starve. Uh, he was the, I believe, the only uh, prisoner hung uh, after the Civil War and, and that was done here. This photo is 1865, was done by Alexander Gardner. Um, in 1867, the building was sold to George Brown, who was Sergeant at Arms at the, at the Senate, and he turned it into boarding houses. Now, this is a, this is a, 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 a photograph of a stereo card, and that's why it's so fuzzy, uh, but, uh, on the right there with a the green arrow, you can see the statue of George Washington that we're gonna talk about it uh, in a moment. But this building with the blue arrow is the reconstituted uh, old brick capital made into some nice looking boarding houses there. Uh, I had never seen this photograph before and was looking, I was looking for photographs of the statue and I came upon this one and then I realized that there in the background is the old brick capital reconstituted as uh, boarding houses. You can see they're really quite attractive, certainly relative to what the building had looked out like before. Uh, by 1929, the, uh, uh, the Congress had purchased uh, these boarding houses and tore them down for the construction of the Supreme Court. But they had been used as the headquarters of the uh, women's suffrage campaign, uh, and uh, so they're very associated with that at the end of the, of the life of the building. Now we're gonna talk about the statue. Uh, here you can see this is uh, Lincoln's inauguration. And again, the blue arrow shows you where that statue was at that point. Um, the statue was designed for the rotunda. Uh, it's by Horatio Greeno. And uh, Greeno thought that he would help educate Americans to great art. He lived in Italy and, and was the most prominent American sculptor there. And he thought the art there was wonderful and that, um, uh, uh, unclothed bodies added to the beauty. Americans did not agree with that. Uh, the statue itself looked rather awkward inside the building and, uh, and so um, uh, they moved it outside. And here's a group of school children looking at it. You can see the um, Olmstead lamp posts in the background there. And uh, uh, this is, this is what it was looked like, looked like outside. And you can get a good picture of George Washington there showing off his muscles. Uh, 
and uh, and teaching us like he was he was a um, a Greek um, uh, leader. But Americans didn't like that. Uh, this is the Latrobe map in 1815, and I put the blue arrow to show you where the statue was. Um, but Greenow knew that that statue was going to be controversial. Uh, he had had an earlier statue that included some some um, uh, little uh, Cupid-like figures called Puti, and uh, they were little boys, and it was showing their little boy parts. And uh, uh, where uh, in the location where it was, some women got together and made diapers and put it on the little boys because they didn't want to see that. Uh, so uh, it the statue proved unpopular. And uh, uh, here's the chronology. Uh, it was commissioned in 1832. It uh, was put in the rotunda in 41, moved outside in 43. Sometime uh, before 1908, it was put outside the patent office, but probably not for very long. Uh, that's the building over on 7th Street that's now the um, uh, um, National Museum of American Art and the Portrait Gallery. Uh, in 1908, it went to the Smithsonian where it uh, sat in the Arts and Industries building and then eventually in the 60s was moved to uh, the uh, museum now known as the Museum of American History. So that's the story of that statue. Um, then this is East Capitol Street. I just want to mention that uh, uh, that uh, it has a story that people wouldn't have thought of. Uh, this was the first street uh, that was leveled in Washington. And the reason is that it sloped down. The, the top of the hill, it was not actually where the Capitol is. The Capitol was at a dramatic point partway up the hill, but the top of the hill was further up East Capitol Street here. And that meant every time it rained, uh, the water would come flowing down East Capitol Street and right onto the Capitol grounds and flood the, the construction project. And so the architect uh, got them, got the uh, uh, Congress to agree to level East Capitol Street. And that meant that it made a logical place to put a market. We have no sense today of how, of how um, uh, hilly this area was and how uneven the ground was. It all looks nice and even to us today, but uh, it was unusual to have an open uh, uh, flat area. And so they decided to put a market there. This is after this, the uh, British invasion, 1815, this, the city market for Capitol Hill was put in the middle of the street here. Uh, there was an earlier market on Capitol Hill uh, on now uh, on New Jersey Avenue down near the, the uh, Navy Yard, but this was for the, the uh, people who lived here at, up at the top of the hill. And the city paid for a, a scale house, that is a, a little place where, where uh, things were weighed uh, out of the of the um, weather and so forth. And uh, it had one employee uh, and along the street here, there was a dry goods store uh, and a bookstore. But that's 1814 that, that, that the market was established. And then, but by 1838, the neighbors petitioned to have the market removed. They said it was a nuisance. Uh, and now it's a very exclusive uh, neighborhood. And those of you that watched the, our, uh, program a few a couple of weeks ago about B.B. French. This is the block where his house was on the right here where the uh, where the Library of Congress is now. Now I'm going to end with one more map. This is the satellite view of the um, of the area and you can see uh, what it looks like now. Let me activate my little um, pointer here. And uh, so here it is. Uh, this is where A Street used to be. You can see A Street actually stops over here, uh, and, uh, and the Supreme Court has been built out there. But A Street came through here. The old brick capital was located here on the corner of A Street. Um, and uh, Walker's uh, building was located about here. Way up here is where the uh, Women's Party moved. And that's where the patio is with the bricks from Walker's Tavern. Uh, this is where the market was here along East Capitol Street. French's house was about here. Um, and then the statue was located just about here uh, after they moved it out of the rotunda over here. 
So I am ready for questions. Yes, Sam? excellent. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry, I'm firing the video back up there. So thank you, Steve. Yep. This has been fascinating. We've got a few questions for you. Uh, first, jumping back to the McNeil Elliott map, uh, we've got a question. Uh, a viewer noted that the state of Maryland was listed as one of the landowners, and they're curious about how that might have come to be. Uh, that was land that was confiscated by the, by the state of Maryland because it belonged to uh, loyalists. And, and uh, in case, I think in, uh, I believe it was the land that was shown there. Well, actually, let me go back up there. There we go. Uh, and here's the land we're talking about that had belonged to a loyalist. Um, I believe the story is that the, that, uh, the loyalist had transferred the ownership to his son, who was, who was a patriot, uh, but the state of Maryland took the land anyway, and it was in litigation for a long time, and that was one of the reasons why it was not developed. But that, uh, there's, uh, the map is much larger. It, in, it includes the entire uh, area, and all the places that had been confiscated uh, were marked as state of Maryland at that point. Sure. Uh, so we've got another question um, asking about the paved streets of Washington. Uh, and in particular, when they started to be paved and when the streets reached a point where they were mostly paved. Um, that would relate to the introduction of sewers and running water uh, for most of the city. Now, uh, people could, could pay to have their own streets paved, uh, which happened in, in a number of cases. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I actually have not done, in, done any study or research there, and that's why I was surprised to find that First Street was still unpaved after the Civil War. But uh, I do know that at the beginning of the Civil War, Pennsylvania Avenue was the only paved street uh, that hadn't been paved by somebody privately uh, for just a block or so. Uh, and so uh, even after the Civil War, it's not paved, but it's that period from then, uh, particularly into the regime of Boss Shepherd, uh, where, they, where they straighten out the streets and and uh, ruin the properties as they did Duddington by, by uh, cutting the streets and, and leaving a very steep hill to get up to your property. Sure, and I think- So that period, uh, it would be heavily done in the, in the early 1870s. But I, I know, let's see, later on the, that uh, Potomac Avenue had been originally called Georgia Avenue, and it was the last of the state avenues that was not paved, and, the, uh, and that irritated a, a member of Congress from Georgia, and he insisted that, uh, that the, the new street that they were building out of Washington, the main road out, which had been called 7th Street Road, uh, was going to be called Georgia Avenue, and that is why Georgia to this day is the one of the original 13 colonies that is not, ha does not have their uh, avenue in the original city. It's fascinating, and it, you know, you can imagine the frustration they might have felt at uh, the only unpaved State Avenue. Uh, we've got a question about the uh, market on East Capitol Street. Uh, and the question uh, regards whether there were any uh, African-American vendors uh, working in the market, uh, perhaps farmers from Maryland as the, as the viewer uh, asks. Uh, I do not have information on that. It would surprise me a lot if there were not, uh, because uh, there were, there were uh, African-Americans uh, who grew food and the logical place to offer it for sale would be that market. And so it would be quite likely uh, but uh, I'm not the one who's done the research on that one. Sure. And then we've got one final question for you before we start to wrap. You know, I see we're going to go ahead and do two final questions here. So there's one uh, asks about uh, Carl Schurz on Capitol Hill. Uh, asks for some uh, further information on, on that fellow. Yes. Uh, uh, Carl Schurz is one of my heroes. And uh, he was sort of the model uh, German immigrant. He was famous. Uh, from the Revolution of 1848 because uh, he was a student and his professor was one of the leaders of the revolution in Frankfurt. And um, uh, knowing the way things operated in Germany, um, Schertz, uh, when, his, when his professor was arrested in, and imprisoned in Spandau, uh, Schertz very dramatically rented a, a, um, a carriage 
and bribed one of the guards and one of the and the guard lowered the professor in a huge basket out of the window of Schwandau prison and uh, Carl Schertz got him into the carriage and rushed him off and they went off to London together. That is one of the dramatic moments of the revolution of 1848 and so Schertz becomes his becomes the the model for that and he comes to America as the hero of the 48ers uh, that we talked about a little bit uh, previous time a, a group of, of very intelligent and, and highly educated Germans who came here as a result of the revolution of 1848 and the failure of it in Germany. So Schertz goes to, um, he comes into Philadelphia uh, and then uh, goes out to uh, Wisconsin where he settles and his wife is the one who had the first kindergarten in America and promoted the idea of kindergarten. That all goes back to Schertz's wife Schertz himself was almost immediately nominated for Lieutenant Governor of Wisconsin uh, and uh, later on becomes a Senator from Missouri. Uh, but uh, 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 as, as I look back through his life to try to find out whether he'd come to Washington, I can't find any sign that he came to Washington until, oh, uh, he campaigned for Lincoln uh, in, in 1851 and, and got a national reputation for that and, and sort of represented uh, along with some others, the, the uh, German immigrants who were quite key in the election of Lincoln. Uh, and uh, we know that he came and visited Lincoln while he was president. Um, and so we know he came to Washington at that point, but uh, as far as I can find, uh, he did not come to Washington in this period. Sure. Uh, you know what we're gonna do, I know I said two already, but we're gonna do two final, cause there's a quick one and then one that I think you're gonna enjoy. We'll start with the quick one. Uh, did the Congress pay a fee to use the old brick Capitol building? Uh, yes, they leased it. Uh, they, they gave a flat amount of money, I believe it was 5,000, this is in the book. Um, they gave a flat amount of money for the furnishings and, uh, and then uh, uh, leased the building in, uh, based on a 6% rate of return on the investment. Wonderful, and so then the last one, uh, before we wrap things up uh, that I think you'll enjoy, uh, that when we talked about the Treaty of Ghent, uh, it was worked out in the Old Brick Capitol, but the viewer uh, points out that President Madison signed the Treaty of Ghent at the Octagon House over in Northwest, and they ask about the connection between the Octagon House and the Capitol, uh, and whether any members of Congress attended that signing, but I'll, I'll let you go ahead and start with the connection there. Well, let me, let me clarify if I didn't make it clear before. What took place in the old brick capital was not the negotiations, but the, but the follow-up from the Treaty of Ghent. Uh, the Treaty of Ghent was negotiated in Ghent and, and, not, uh, and not here uh, in Washington. But there, uh, there were a lot of negotiations coming to an agreement on who owed what money and, and that kind of thing. And, um, and those negotiations took place after the, after the signing in the, in the Octagon House. Uh, there would have been members of Congress, I'm pretty sure. I don't, I don't know much about the signing of the treaty, but I can't imagine that they did not sign it with some members of Congress present. Sure, and then- And there prob probably were members of Congress amongst the commissioners uh, that, were, that were doing the negotiations in the Old Brick Capitol. Sure, and then just the connection between the Octagon House and the U.S. Capitol building. Uh, well, the clearest one is that William Thornton designed them both. Uh, he, he was, his design was much more successful at the uh, Octagon House, and uh, he's regarded as a good domestic architect, but uh, uh, he was completely untrained as an architect, and, and um, uh, not a lot of nice things are said about his design for the Capitol building. Well, I want to thank you again for uh, this wonderful uh, this wonderful presentation. I've worked I've had the pleasure of working with Steve for the better part of four years, and I still learn something new every time we we chat. So uh, it's been a pleasure to be with and to be with all of you uh, joining us through the webinar. So I will point out that the Historical Society isn't government funded, and we do rely on the support of our wonderful members and donors. Uh, and so if you can, we appreciate it. And Steve and I are both wearing. USCHS neckties today. So if you're looking for some nice Father's Day gifts, perhaps, or just an any occasion gift, uh, please be sure to check out our merchandise website, uschscatalog.org. Uh, and then let, all the, go ahead, Steve. Let me add, Sam, that my, my tie is designed after the coffers in the, in the dome. That's the connection. 
So looking at Steve, it's like looking up into the, the great dome of the Capitol building there. Uh, I just have little flags and domes on the outside, but it's- uh, there's I have a dome in honor. <laughs> there we go. Well, we, again, we want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, we wish you well, and we look forward to seeing you next week.